I thank God for the opportunity to be with us at this program, the Levites Gathering. I appreciate God for the life of the convener of the meeting, my dear son, Jesu Tobi Abuola. And I pray that God will continue to help him and the team members to continue to forge ahead in the name of Jesus. I equally thank God for a wonderful beginning which he gave us yesterday with uh, evangelist Damilola Mike Babiloye. It was such a wonderful and deep teaching as God helped him to open our eyes to what the mantle really is. Uh, tonight, we'll be going a step further to look at the theme of the program, Eligible for the Mantle. Please, can we have a word of prayer before I go into what God has for us? Almighty Father, we thank you so very much for making this uh, night a reality, the second night of uh, this program, the Levites Gathering. Thank you for how you began with us yesterday. Lord, take the praise in Jesus' name. As we move ahead tonight, Lord, please reveal your mind to us. Help me to speak forth that which you want us to hear. I pray the spirit that wants to impress human beings will not prosper in the name of Jesus. But your Holy Spirit that expresses your mind to me will have its way. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray it. Amen. Again, I am speaking on eligible for the mantle. Uh, let me begin by giving a definition of the word eligible. I picked this directly from the dictionary. Eligible means to be entitled or qualified to do, to be, or to get something. Now, what is the mantle? The mantle is a scriptural symbol for a calling a ministry, an anointing, or an office given to individuals by God. Uh, this suffices for definitions, because where we are going to is far, and I don't have much time. So I want to boil down this message to the very essence now, eligible for the mantle. Let's look at the case study here. In the book of 4 Samuel, chapter 16, verse 1, uh, verse 1 says, and the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him? Take note of that. I have rejected him from reigning over Israel. Fill thine arms with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesus the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. Seeing I have rejected him. This is God speaking to Samuel about Saul. So he was given a report of the state of Saul at that time that he had been rejected from reigning over Israel. Now, this is one fact I want us to see. Whatever it was that made God to find Saul no longer eligible for kingship provides an answer to why he found David eligible for kingship. I hope you got that. For example, if most of your seniors fail and carry over a particular course in school. The best way for you not to also fail and carry over the same course is to find out why they failed. So the question is, why was Saul rejected? The answer is very obvious. He disobeyed God's commandment. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 9 to verse 11. Listen to what the Bible says there. But Saul and the people speared Agag, you remember when Saul led his people in the battle against the Amalekites and the instruction was that he should utterly destroy everything. Now the Bible says, but Saul and the people speared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatling and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. The instruction was that he should utterly destroy everything. And here the Bible is saying, and will not utterly destroy them. This is showing us the place where he fell into the pit of disobedience. Now let's go on. But everything that was vile and refused, that they destroyed utterly. Then, this is verse 10, then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, it repented me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he is turned back from following me, and have not performed my commandment. And it gripped Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. 
So why did the mantle of kingship fall on David from this verse? It was because God found in David what was missing in Saul. Take note of that. God found in David what was missing in Saul. What made Saul no longer eligible was what God found in David that made him eligible. Remember, we are looking at eligible for the mantle. And now specifically, we are said that what brought uh, Saul down was disobedience. But what is the Bible telling us in Acts 13, 22? And when he had removed him, who? When God had removed Saul, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own earth, which shall keep and fulfill all my will. Hallelujah. I have found. At this point, I want to pray for you from the prophetic platform. God will find you suitable in the name of Jesus. I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own earth, which shall fulfill all my will. So, David was a man after God's heart. Listen to the way the Message Bible puts it. A man whose heart beats to my heart. That's God speaking. That David's heart beats according to his own heart. Meaning the heartbeat of David, so to say, was in sync, in synchronization with the heartbeat of God. In other words, David gave God pleasure. And look at the other part of that same scripture. That is the book of Acts, which you saw, 1322, where the King James says, we shall fulfill all my will. The message Bible says, a man who will do what I tell him. If you want to be found eligible, you must be one who is truly ready to obey God. We'll be looking at this in depth in a short while. You must be one who is truly ready to obey. Your watchword will be whatever he tells me to do, I will do. Not minding what anybody says, not minding what anybody does. So we are coming to what we are uh, really looking at tonight, eligibility for the mantle. I have just a few points here. Number one, quickly, knowledge. For you to be truly eligible for the mantle, you need knowledge. What kind of knowledge? Is it academic knowledge? Is it social knowledge? Is it marital knowledge? Brother Mike, what kind of knowledge are you talking about? And this is it. You must know that God predetermines you with your mantle. In other words, God is the one who predetermines the mantle for everyone. Still, in other words, everybody is divinely configured for a specific mantle. In other words, still, God sent every man to the world with a specific purpose. The only problem is some people live through life without discovering purpose, not to talk of fulfilling purpose. What a wasted life. What a way to live in frustration. I pray for you this will not be your portion in the name of Jesus. Let's look at Joseph as a case study here. God showed Joseph prophetic dreams as a pre-indication of his mantle. You remember? The Bible says in Genesis 37, 5 to 10, that he kept having dreams after dreams. He kept dreaming. He saw this, he saw that. He saw the sheaves, he saw the moon, he saw the stars. He kept seeing that he had a glorious future ahead of him. And the future was not the future of just a mean man. It was the future of leadership. So God showed him via those prophetic dreams, a pre-indication of his mantle. So you must have a knowledge that God predetermines your mantle. Remember Elisha? At a point, Elijah cast his mantle on Elisha as a predetermination of his mantle that he was going to step into a very, very big prophetic role in the future. Even when Elisha did not really understand it. You know, he said he was going to meet his father and his mother to bid them farewell. And eventually he came back, he burned his asses, he burned everything he had. Why? Because he knew he had received a higher calling. It was a predetermination of his mantle. He had not really gotten there. So, beloved, you must have a knowledge that God predetermines your mantle. You remember Jeremiah? In Jeremiah 1, 4 to 5, you received a prophetic word as a notice of his predetermined mantle. 
At a point, Jeremiah shouted, Ah, but I am a child. But God told him, Say not, I am a child. So, beloved, there is a predetermination of your mantle. You may be asking me, Man of God, are you talking about destiny? Yes, if you look at it as destiny, being the vehicle to a destination. Yes, God is leading you to a destination that he has predetermined for you. But you need a mantle who will be the driver of that vehicle. This is what we are talking about here. Eligibility for the mantle. You must understand God sent you to the world for a specific purpose. God does not create any human being just to come and observe things in the world. You are here to add value to God's kingdom, to add value to humanity. You are not here just to be an onlooker. No, but you must know that God predetermines it. This will help you if you settle it in your mind. Number two, servanthood. This positions you for your predetermined mantle. Elisha, as we saw earlier, had the mantle of Elijah cast on him at the very, very beginning. But he was a servant to Elijah for a long time. We'll be seeing this in the next point in the short while. He was a servant to Elijah for a long time. Second Kings chapter 3, verse 11. Listen, but Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And one of the king of Israel's servants answered and said, here is Elisha. Listen to that introduction. The son of Shaphat, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. This is talking about servanthood. This is where a lot of young ones are missing it this day. They don't want to serve anybody. They just want to rise and get there in the, in the, in the night. Just at the snap of a finger, at the blink of an eyelid. They want to be there. They want to be known as supposed to prophet, doctor, uh, bishop, archbishop, everything. And at times I laugh when the title is longer than the name. Can you imagine that? <laughs> when the title is longer than the name. This is what a lot of people carry around. But if you carry a title without an entitlement, then you are a titled fool. Please forgive my choice of word because it is actually foolishness for one to carry a title without an entitlement. So when you enter into a calling, into a purpose, without having served at all, then you can't really receive the mantle. There is a place of servitude. This positions you for your predetermined mantle. Allow me to repeat. You remember Joseph as well. I said earlier that he had all manner of dreams that he was going to become a ruler in the end. Praise God for that. But Joseph practiced servanthood for years. You'll be wondering how, where, when. He served his father. You have this all over the book of Genesis, where you have the account of Joseph. He served his father. He served Potiphar, didn't he? Of course, he did. Joseph could have gotten angry at a point in his life that God never told me I would be ending up a slave boy. The dreams I saw was a dream of leadership. That I'm going to become a king, become a ruler, become a highly placed person. Look at me, a houseboy. But he understood the process. He served Potiphar. In fact, he ended up in the prison. Another reason, enough, that will make a person like Joseph become very annoyed. To say, again, look at me in the prison. God, are you really there? No. He served with the light. He served the prison warden. Because he knew it was going somewhere to happen. Just like I believe my hearers this day, you are equally going somewhere to happen and you will actually happen for God in the name of Jesus. Can you say big amen to that to seal that prophecy? I say you are going somewhere to happen and you'll actually get there and happen for the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. Servanthood, you must be willing to serve. Number three, be patient. Be patient. This is a prerequisite for the delivery of mantles in life and ministry. Patience. Looking at our case study again, Joseph and Elisha, you see that mantles did not jump on them. They did not jump the gun to receive their mantles. They patiently waited for their times. Actually, Joseph waited for a little over 13 years because he was sold into slavery when he was about 17 years. You can check that out in Genesis 37 verse 2. And he became a prime minister when he was 30 years old. Genesis 41, 46. Can you see that? 
about 13 years. Those years were long enough to make anyone lose interest. That God, what is that thing you want to make me into that you are taking so much time? But everything about God is a process. Remember Elisha. He waited actually for six years serving Elijah before that thing actually happened that turned his life around. Patience. Patience. God will make, can make a woman conceive tonight and put to bed tomorrow. Can't God? Of course he can. He can do all things. But God allows a process of nine months to take place when the baby will gradually grow in the womb and become a full-grown baby, uh, suitable, eligible to be born. Any baby that runs out of the womb before the maturity date, before the date of delivery, ends up in the incubator. That's what you call a prem, a premature baby. So, beloved, don't rush out of your place of making. Be patient. Bid your time. Just know that God is working on you. Don't allow any man to determine your life. Because the truth is this. No man holds the timetable of your life. So nobody can hurry you. I remember when I was in the university, in my course of study, I know my timetable. And my mates who were offering courses different from mine, maybe going to the examination all, that they were eager to go in will not make me go in with them because I knew they were offering courses different from mine. So I wait, I know my own time will come for me to enter my own examination or for my own examination. But if I go there to sit with them, of course, if they make a mistake of giving me a question paper, you can be sure I'll not be able to answer the questions because I've entered into the wrong examination hall. A lot of people are in the wrong examination hall. They are writing the wrong examination. Even if they manage to put something down and submit their papers, you can be sure that the examiner will not have their names on the register because, because the road is not actually their course. So, beloved, learn to be patient. Remember, the Bible says, but we have need of patience, that after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. You need to be patient. There is a difference between landing and climbing. Let me explain Mount Everest is said to be the highest mountain on planet Earth. It is actually said to be 29 and 35,000 feet above sea level, quite high. So a lot of people have been known to scale Mount Everest because they climb from the base up there. But if you choose to enter an helicopter and the helicopter carries you up there and you get to the peak of Mount Everest, we say of you that you have landed on Mount Everest. But the person who goes from the base is actually said to have climbed Mount Everest. You can land in no time. Climbing takes time. But the truth of the matter is this, beloved. When you land, there is no celebration. When you climb, there is attention and celebration. That's the truth about life. Learn to climb carefully. Learn to climb gradually. Learn to climb according to God's timetable you will get there. Of course, there will be obstacles along the way. There will be issues along the way. There will be distractions along the way. But keep climbing. Keep climbing. Let's look at point number four. Learn obedience. Hebrews 5, 8 says, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. That's talking about Jesus, the son of the living God. He learned obedience by the things which he suffered. If you truly want to receive the mantle, you must be one who is given to obedience. Remember we said that earlier, that Saul lost his kingship because of disobedience. David got it because he was a man after God's own earth. The Bible goes on to say in that book of Acts that we saw earlier, that he is one that will fulfill all that I tell him to do. Meaning God saw David as one who would obey him. So you must learn obedience. Whatever he tells you to do, you do. There is an account here, you remember very well, in Luke chapter 5, verse 4 to verse 10. Verse 4 says, Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and lay down your nets for a draught. Launch out into the deep. It was a simple instruction. And Simon answered and said unto him, Master, we've toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. So what did Simon do here? <laughs> Listen, he was expressing his disappointment by saying they had caught nothing. 
But I love the end of that verse. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. However, he was wise enough to allow obedience to prevail. He expressed his disappointment. In life, you might have come to some brick walls where you can no longer go ahead. That is the point of having caught nothing. Your life may look meaningless. What am I really pursuing? What is my life all about? You look around, it's as if you are not really achieving anything. That is looking like you have toiled all night and you have taken nothing. Don't allow the sentence to end there. Like Simon heard, nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. Meaning I will not let down my head. It is a net I will let down. My head will not be bowed in sorrow, in disappointment, in pain. I will not give up. I will not be depressed. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will lay down the net. Because you have spoken, Master, I will obey. Verse 6 says, And when they had this done, that is when they had laid down the net, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net break. Hallelujah. It was after obeying the instruction that they went from nothing to more than enough. Their story changed from net washing to net breaking. They were washing the net a moment ago. Now here, their net is breaking because their catch was so massive. You know what happened thereafter? The Bible says in verse 7, and they beckoned, that is, they called unto their partners, which were in the other sheep, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. It was a boat sinking catch. It did not come from the sky. It came from simple obedience. Nevertheless, at thy word. So this is what happens when you learn obedience and you live in obedience. You discover that you not only catch so much, you now call unto partners. The Bible says in the King James, and they become unto their partners. So meaning in life and ministry is a place of partnership. They called unto people to come and help them. Bring your sheep. We can't carry this alone. And these people came. That all the sheep, the Bible says, both sheep, Simon's sheep and the sheep that was brought, were so filled that both were sinking. Again, remember, this miracle came from the place of obedience. And what happened after this? I love it. The mantle dropped. This is actually where I'm coming to. When Simon Peter saw it, that's verse 8, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Verse 10, And so was also James and John and the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. They were in his ship with him. They equally declared the same thing. Depart from us, we are sinful men. What brought this about? They saw a miracle like they had never seen before. The people were that were about giving up. Now, packing so much, which came from the place of obedience. So they said, Jesus should leave them, that we are sinful men. But blessed be God in verse 10. Listen to what the Bible says in the B part. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. That was the mantle. If Simon had missed it earlier, if he had refused to launch his net into the deep, this statement would not have come. Jesus would have left him. But he let down his net. He caught so much and he saw the power of Jesus. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. You no longer be a fisher of fish. You are now becoming a fisher of men. And let me tell you, that was the predetermined mantle for the life of Simon. The divine mantle of fisher of men fell on him. He would have missed it if he had failed to obey that simple instruction. Launch out into the deep. And he might have missed it forever, but he obeyed. So, beloved, you must learn obedience. And you ask me, what is it I am to obey? You are to obey whatever God tells you to do. How do I know what God wants me to do? Very simple. You know through the word of God. So, how do you know the word of God? If you do not read the word of God, no way. So you must be a student of the Bible. I'm using the word student, not a reader of the Bible. You read the Bible, yes. You study the Bible and meditate on divine instructions from the word of God. Whatever it tells you to do, you do it. Beloved, again, how do I know what God wants me to do? You listen to instructions from men of God. 
And when I say man of God, I'm afraid to leave it at that. From genuine man of God. Because there are a lot of psychophants out there. <laughs> hey, there are a lot of people out there that claim to be men of God, teachers of the word of God. There are a lot of motivational speakers disguising as preachers of the word. Be careful of them. No, sincere men of God, those who carry the heart of God, those who want to, do, I mean, let people know the mind of God, listen to them. You can get instructions from them too. How do I know the mind of God? Listen to elders. Beloved, there are elders who actually know the mind of God. Listen to them. You must not come to a point where you think you don't need to listen to anybody. I know all I need to know all alone. No, no man is an island. There are people who have gone the way you have gone. I keep telling people as a minister of God, one thing that hurts me the most, or one of the things that hurt me the most, is when I see young ministers making the same mistakes we made when we were just starting and going through unnecessary pains simply because they refuse to ask or they ask but refuse to ask it. It pains me a lot. Every man has his own wilderness to pass through. But there are some wildernesses that God does not want you to pass through because some people have been through it before you. All you need to do is sit at their feet, listen to them. And then they will guide you, of course. You pass through your own wilderness. But you don't waste your time passing through wildernesses that God does not intend for you. So these are the ways you get instructions from God. Can I repeat again? You get instructions from God from reading the word of God. You get instructions from God from listening to genuine preachers of the word of God. You get instructions from God from elders, sincere, godly elders who have been through what you want to go through. You get instructions from God from all these means and many more. Let's go to point number five. We are gradually coming to the end. You must be focused. Second Kings chapter 2, 1 to 15. After this, please just take your time and read that portion of the scripture. Then you study, opening your mind to the Holy Spirit and see what actually happened there. I'll be sharing with you what God has shown me from this account over the years. You see, Elisha got the double of the spirit of Elijah. Take note, he did not get a double of the anointing of Elijah. It was a double of the spirit. We often say double of the anointing. No, the anointing is actually a subset of what he got. So the anointing was part of his spirit. So he got a double of Elijah's spirit. I mean, anointing, a double of his unction, his grace, his person, his personality. He got a double of everything that made Elijah, Elijah. How did he get it? He got it by focus. You really want the mantle? You must get it. But you get it by focus. Avoid distractions. You know, the journey began at Gilgal. Gilgal is said to be the rolling place. This was where God rolled away the reproach of each Egyptian slavery from the neck of the Israelites. This was where the Israelites encamped after crossing the Jordan. This was where they kept the first Passover in the land of Canaan. This was where they set up the 12 memorial stones that they took from Jordan. It was at Gilgal that the children of Israel were circumcised. But Elisha refused to stay at Gilgal. He moved on. He pressed on with his master. And they moved on to Bethel. You remember, Elijah told him he was going to Bethel, that she should stay back in Gilgal. But he said, no, my Lord, as you live, as your soul lives, no, I'm going with you. And the Bethel is said to be the altar, the house of God. This was where the sons of the prophets called Elijah's attention to what was about to happen. What did they say? They told him, your master will be taken from you. But take note of this. If the sons of the prophets could tell Elisha, that his master was going to be taken from him. That meant they knew what was about to happen. Unfortunately, they were not interested in it. So, beloved, this man we are talking about, it's not everyone that is really interested. I thank God for the organizers of the program coming up with a theme like this. Not everyone is actually interested in any mantle. All they need is just to make it. So, the sons of the prophet knew something was about to happen. They were not interested. They only told him, do you know your master will be taken from you? But I love Elisha. He said, yes, I know. Hold your peace. Meaning it's a matter of time. You are going to see what will become of my life. In other words, I know. You wait and see. He refused to tarry at Bethel. 
He did not terminate his journey at Bethel. Why? Because he wanted more than the house of God. You know, Bethel means the house of God, the altar of God. So he wanted something that was more than the house of God. He wanted the God of the house. So he moved on to Jericho with his master. And what does Jericho stand for? Jericho is said to be the place of fragrance, sweet odor, the place of charisma. Charisma may get you to the top, beloved. Character keeps you there. Let me repeat. Charisma may get you to the top. It is character that keeps you there. A lot of people are charismatic, but they suffer character deficiency. The best you could see of them is when they are on the pulpit, handling the microphone, is when they sing, is when they are in a movie. That's the best you could see of them. They are charismatic. But when you talk of character, they suffer acute character deficiency. So he wanted something beyond charisma. He knew there was something better than charisma. The sons of the prophets told him again. They tried to dissuade him. He told them to hold their peace again. So he did not terminate his journey at Jericho because he wanted something more than charisma. They crossed over to Jordan. But when they were going to Jordan, actually they had to part the Jordan. You see, I'm saying they because Elisha was going with Elijah. So if you tell the story later, he must have told people that we parted the Jordan when we were going to Jericho. I mean, going from Jericho to Jordan. We parted River Jordan. So the Jordan is actually said to be the fountain, the source, the watering place. The 50 sons of the prophet stood afar to watch. So in life, you have watchers and workers. Watchers, watch, workers, working. So they went to the platform to watch from afar. So after Elijah had parted with the mantle, the two of them crossed over. And at the other side of Jordan, that was when Elijah now spoke. He said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. Take note, all along, the only words Elijah uttered were, 30 here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me. 30 here, stay here, remain here. He did not say anything other than this all along the journey. And Elisha's constant response was, as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. This is the hallmark of those who are truly eligible for the mantle. Father, not until you baptize me fully into the full dimension of your purpose for my life, I will not leave thee. I will not backslide. I will not turn back. I will not start following you. Lord, I will not leave thee. My eyes are on you. My focus are a family fixed on you. This is what truly makes you eligible. You must be fully focused. Elisha refused to tarry. He maintained his focus. After seeing that Elisha had passed the test of focus, he said, ask what I shall do for thee. Verse 10. And he said, thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me, when I'm taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. Full stop. Very simple. Mr. Man, you have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me, can you see that? You have asked a hard thing, but to get a hard thing, simple, if you see me. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, so meaning Elijah continued to talk to Elisha. I can't tell what he was telling Elisha, but I'm sure some of those things will be enough to distract him. He might be pointing him to something. Look at that place. Oh, that was where we held the first crusade when I started my ministry. Look at the other side. Oh, that was where I first got my first set of sons of the prophet. Oh, look at this. Look at that. I'm sure Elisha never took his eyes away from Elijah, because the instruction was, if you see me, beloved, you want to receive the mantle in its fullness, keep your eyes on God. The Bible goes on to say, and it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire, and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder, and Elisha went up by a whirlwind into heaven, verse 12, and Elisha saw it, 
Hallelujah. Elisha saw it. I pray for somebody who will say, believing, amen. You will see it tonight. Hey, before you leave planet Earth at full old age, you will see God in his fullness. You will see the workings of his hand. Oh, you will see the move of his spirit. You enjoy the full dimension of his glory in the name of Jesus. And Elisha saw it and he cried, my father, my father. You know what that means? My father raised to power too. My father, my father. You know why? In case you don't know, I saw it. And you don't hear the first, my father. You hear the second one. My father, my father. The chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. You know what that means? He described everything they saw. So that Elijah will not say, no, you didn't see me. He called him, my father, my father. Number one, I saw you going. I saw the chariot of Israel. I saw the horsemen riding the chariot. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. He took hold of his own clothes. Listen, the Holy Spirit told me expressly, his own clothes here is symbolic of the flesh and its manifestation. His own clothes, that was the interpretation the Holy Spirit gave to me. And this is helping me. He took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. So to be truly eligible for the mantle, beloved, you must tear and put off your own clothes. What are the clothes? The clothes of pride, the clothes of envy, worldliness, inordinate ambition, spirit of competition, and so on and so forth. You must put off the clothes of pride. When you ride on the horse of pride, hey, you cannot amount to anything in the hands of God. Hey, because God gives grace to the humble, but he receives the proud. That, you find that in the book of James. When God helps you, you are truly helped. When God resists you, no man can help you. He receives the proud and gives grace to the humble. Run away from the cloth, the garment of pride. Run away from the garment of envy. Run away from the garment of worldliness, flamboyance, paparazzi. Hey, beloved, don't strive to become a celebrity. No. Your purpose must be to see God being celebrated through your life at every point in time. Avoid inordinate ambition. I want to become this. I want to become that. No. I just want to become what God wants me to become. What God makes of, of, my, of my life thereafter is in his hands. Avoid the spirit of competition. We are in ministry. We are in life to complement one another, not to compete with one another. And verse 13 says, he took up also the mantle of Elijah. Listen, that fell from him. I love this. That fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. Elijah did not grab or pull the mantle from Elijah. It fell. You see, when you are eligible for the mantle, it will fall. That's just it. It will fall when you are eligible. When you're not eligible, you go to the mountain 40 days, 40 nights with dry fasting and pray. Lord, lay your hand upon me. Lord, use me. If the eligibility is not there, you won't receive anything. You just go there to make a show. It fell. Elisha did not grab it. He did not pull it. The thing fell. Correct anointing is not tapped. It is trapped. If you don't re remember anything in this teaching, please remember this. Correct anointing is not tapped. It is trapped. You trap it. You trap it. So a lot of young ones we say, I tap into your anointing. You touch me when I'm moving. You lay your hand upon my garment. Lay your hand upon my chair. Beloved, you are not tapping anything. You are only feeling the texture of my dress. You trap it. You trap it. It is not enough to convert, to convert my kind of grace. You must be ready to run my kind of race. <laughs> oh, I convert your grace. Grace is good to convert it. But, sir, be ready to run my kind of race. What a lot of our fathers went through to get to where they are today. A lot of young people do not want to go through it. All they need, they, they know is I tap into it. I tap into it. I covet it. I receive it. Great. I don't dispute that and I don't despise that either. But, beloved, all I know is that you must be ready to run their kind of race. When you are truly eligible for the mantle, it will drop on you. Is a case study here, Elisha. The mantle fell. It fell on its own. Verse 14. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him. Repeating it again. That fell from him. For emphasis. To let you know. He did not grab it. He did not pull it. That fell from him. 
and he spoke the waters. Meaning, when he turned back, River Jordan departed when Elijah was leading him there had already filled up again. He took the mantle that fell, that was now in his hand, he smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? Now, I don't really understand this. I have a feeling maybe he smote it the first time and the water did not part. Ah, what is happening? In pigeon, waiting with this now. <laughs> and he cried, uh -uh, I've got it now. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted either and thither, and Elisha went over. Hallelujah. The waters of life will part for you. Every wall of difficulty will fall for you. Every mountain of no way will become plain for you in the name of Jesus. And listen, listen very well. When Elijah was going to Jordan, the last miracle he performed was the parting of the river. Jordan. When Elisha was coming back, the first miracle he performed was a parting of the river Jordan. Meaning, what was the last for Elijah was the beginning for Elisha. <laughs> hey, that was an indicator for a life of greatness. A life that was going to make great impact for God Almighty. Why? He received the mantle. And verse 15, and when the sons of the prophets, which were to view at Jericho, saw him they said, hey, the spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. The Bible says, they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. All along, the sons of the prophets did not move close to Elisha. They only spoke words of discouragement to him. However, after Elisha got the mantle, they came to him and bowed to him. The mantle commands attention. Hallelujah. When you receive the mantle, the world will come to you. They come looking for you. Not minding the corner of the world in which you are. Remember, John the Baptist was in the wilderness. He was feeding on locusts. He was clothed with sheepskin. The man was a complete village man, a bushman. But yet, the whole world came looking for him to be baptized. Jesus, the son of the living God, went looking for John the Baptist, even in the wilderness where he was. Why? He carried a mantle. So the sons of the prophets came to him. The Bible says they came to meet him and bowed themselves to him. This is what the mantle does. Situations bow to you. Conditions bow to you. Circumstances bow to you. Hey, demons bow before you. You find unbelievers bow to the living king even as you minister. You find the grace of God manifest in your life. But then, beloved, you must beware of three things. We have looked at eligibility for the mantle. And I believe from my heart that you will operate even at your place where God has ordained you with your own mantle in the name of Jesus. But beware of these three things. Number one, eligibility for the mantle is not a right. It is a privilege. Keep this at the back of your mind. This will help you a lot. So that when the mantle comes, you will not boast around, ah, ah, I must receive it. I fasted. Oh, I must receive it. My father is a great man of God. I must receive it. Oh, I labored. I even served. No, it's not a right. It's a privilege. Remember Romans 9.15. That Bible says, For he said unto Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. So you receiving the mantle is on account of his mercy. So don't see it as a right. It's a privilege. When you remember this, is to help you not to misuse and not to abuse the grace that God bestows upon you. Number two thing you must be aware of, the eligibility can be lost. That eligibility we are talking of can be lost. Saul was eligible. That was why he became a king in the first place, by divine mercy. But David was chosen in his place because he lost it. Remember, Samson equally lost it. He died even before really starting his ministry. The eligibility can be lost. So don't enter into the place of carrying the mantle and begin to think that you have arrived. Nothing can happen again. It can be lost. Number three, the eligibility can be missed. Gehazi was the most eligible to take over from Elisha. We can't go into that tonight. Well, remember that account in 2 Kings 5, 1 down to there about 27, I think, yes. Unfortunately, he missed it. Verse 26 says, And he said unto him, Went not mine heart with thee, 
That is Elisha talking to Gehazi after he had drawn after Naaman to collect stuff from him. He went on to say, when the man turned again from his chariot to midday, is it the time to receive money and to receive garments and olive yards and vineyards and sheep and oxen and men servants and maid servants? Is it the time? Meaning there was going to be a time that all of this become commonplace in the life of Gehazi. But the man was not patient. And verse 27. Ha! This frightens me. And this forms the basis for my prayer. What did Elisha say? He said, the leprosy therefore of Naaman shall cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever. And they went out from his presence a leper as white as snow. In other words, you took the garment from this man. You took money from him. Young man, you forgot to take his leprosy. The leprosy are removed from his body a moment ago. He's still there in the backyard. It has not gone far. Receive it as well. And the man became a leper. And he went out from his presence. Of course, you know, lepers live outside the city gate. So meaning he became uh, no longer a bona fide citizen of the city. He was cast out. He missed it. Instead of receiving any portion of the spirit of Elisha, he received the heavy portion of the leprosy of Naaman. Why? He missed his eligibility. Beloved, I pray for you and myself. This will not be our portion in the name of Jesus Christ. So this is what God has sent me to tell us at this meeting. I pray again that we will not miss our place of eligibility in the name of Jesus. Let us go before God and pray for just a few minutes. Beloved, go before the Almighty and just appreciate him. If you have learned anything tonight, just tell God, thank you. Tell him, Lord, thank you for speaking to me. Even if it's only one sentence that has made an impact upon you, thank God for it. So go ahead and talk to God. Father, find me eligible. Lord, you know, I'm using the word find me. It's not enough to be eligible. You must be found eligible. God spoke of David. I have found. I have found. Father, find me eligible. Open your mouth and pray that prayer. The way you found David. Father, find me eligible. Go ahead and pray the second prayer point. Daddy, wherever I have missed it. Where I have run foul of your expectation. Maybe by my lack of knowledge. Oh, by my failure to serve. Oh, by my impatience. Oh, by my disobedience. Oh, Lord, by my loss of focus, whatever it is that has made me fall. Oh, below your expectation, Lord, let your mercy speak. Beloved, avoid every distraction at this time. Pray, because I can see God turning destinies around, reviving destinies. Oh, empowering destinies. I can see mantles falling upon everyone in the house and every hearer of this message in the name of Jesus. Make sure you open your mouth and let God hear you. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Listen, the final prayer point now. There is something that is so terrible as a testimony. When they say, he is an ex-champion. Kai, 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 kai. That is a very terrible phrase. Ex-champion. Former rich man. Hey, ex anointed minister of God, meaning once upon a time. You will cry unto God now and say, God, don't allow your dealings, your workings, and my work with you to become once upon a time. Don't allow me to lose my eligibility. Where you see me and you receive gladness concerning my life, don't allow my life to bring sadness to you. Open your mouth and cry unto God. Father, help me. Help me, help me. Oh, uphold me, Lord. Don't allow me to go out of your radar. In the name of Jesus. Hey, Adam and Eve went off radar. They were still in the Garden of Eden, but they were no longer in the presence of God. God had to cry, where art thou? Father, help me not to go off your radar. Don't allow me to be missing in action. 
Don't allow the kingdom of hell to rejoice over me. <laughs> Father, help me, uphold me, strengthen me. For the next one minute, open your mouth and pray. Praise to your holy name, Daddy. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Almighty Father, we thank you for this uh, touch of your power. Thank you, thank you for speaking expressly to us. Thank you for revealing your mind to us. I pray, Lord, that beyond the logos that have come forth, you imprint the rima on our hearts in the name of Jesus. For everyone responding with a believing amen, I stand as an oracle of the Most High God and say concerning you, your life will not remain the same. You will fulfill divine purpose. Every power commissioned by hell or to stand against you fulfilling destiny and purpose. I say such powers are rendered null and void in the name of Jesus Christ. Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? Thou shalt be made plain. That's the word of God. I stand upon the integrity of the word of God and declare that every mountain of hindrance before you, eh, militating against the divine fulfillment of purpose in your life, they are made plain. This day in the name of Jesus. Oh, the grace of God will be upon you. The hand of God will be upon you. And heaven will have every reason to keep rejoicing. I pray, Lord, ultimately what matters most is to make it home to heaven with you. Release this grace upon us. To you be the praise forever, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Thank you. God bless you all.